In today's brief, we'll talk about the new axis of evil between Russia, China, and Iran, the latter's worst losses in 2023, and Republican politics. I'm Yulia, and today is Monday, October 30th, 2023. You're listening to the Ukraine War Brief Podcast, where we deliver the news from Ukraine in as much depth and detail as journalism can bring. Let's start with the news from the front. The Russian invaders are putting heavy pressure on the Ukrainian defense forces across the front. A source on the ground called the situation very difficult. Russia has made progress in Avdiivka, but they haven't made it to the critical coke plant. They've tied down a large amount of Ukrainian defense forces in that area, however. The Russians are also attacking in Kupinsk, as predicted by the U.S. National Security Council last week. The U.S. also predicted that Russians would attack in Liman. After weeks of a media blackout, we can report that the Ukrainians have established a bridgehead on the east side of the Dnipro River in Kherson Oblast. We're very careful on what we report in this area, as Ukrainian special operations forces are still working. Deep State's conservative approach created a 100-square-kilometer gray zone across the Dnipro to Kherson city. The contested zone stretches from Hola Pristin up to Korsunka. Reports of the complete liberation of Krynke are false although Ukraine has established partial control. If Russian media is to be believed, Colonel General Makarevich, commander of the Russian so-called Dnieper force, was fired for allegedly knowing about Ukraine's plans to cross the Dnipro and doing nothing about it. He was supposedly replaced by a Colonel General Teplinsky. Now let's do a deeper dive. The General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GSAFU, released its morning operational update from Friday, October 27th through Monday, October 30th. Each morning report covers combat engagements, summaries, and estimates of Russian losses for the previous 24 hours. For the period covered in these four reports, there were 260 combat engagements, and Russian losses included 2,820 personnel, 49 tanks, 60 armored combat vehicles, or ACVs, 47 artillery systems, 3 air defense systems, or their components, and 30 tactical operational unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs, drones. By the time this podcast episode comes out, Ukraine will very likely have recorded killing or wounding 300,000 Russian personnel. Aw, sad. Every day covered in this report, Ukrainian civilians were injured or killed due to Russian shelling and airstrikes. 280 settlements in Chernihiv, Sumy, Kharkiv, Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson oblasts were attacked. Just today, a 91-year-old woman was killed in Kherson due to indiscriminate shelling and guided bombs. The Ukrainian Air Force's morning reports, like GSAFUs, covers events from the previous 24 hours, but aren't necessarily released daily. Four reports were released from October 27th through October 30th. 19 out of 20 Shahed 131-136 kamikaze drones, 2 out of 3 known KH-59 cruise missiles, 3 out of 4 Iskander K ballistic missiles launched from Jankoy Kirim towards Dnipropetrovsk were destroyed, with the 4th missing its target. Russia launched an Iskander M missile from Voronezh to Kharkiv Oblast. On October 27th, the Air Force released a special report saying air defense destroyed three KH-59 missiles and two Lancet drones. We don't know how many KH-59s and Lancets were launched, though. We also noticed a slowdown in operational tempo over the weekend as poor weather moved in, but it has now cleared. The Security Service of Ukraine, or the SBU, reported that special operations forces destroyed 145 pieces of Russian equipment over various sectors of the front over the past two weeks. The SOF also destroyed 44 fortifications and at least two ammunition depots as well. The SBU even managed to release a, mm, shall I say, cute video of some of the kit that was destroyed? 19 tanks, 20 artillery pieces, and 10 electronic warfare systems are no longer with the Russian army as a result. According to the general staff, Russian forces kept trying to advance in the east, with most fighting concentrated in the Kupinsk, Liman, Bakhmut, Avdiivka, Marienka, Shakhtarsk, and Zaporizhia fronts. Let's move clockwise, starting in liberated Kupinsk in Kharkiv Oblast. The Hortice Operational Strategic Group is responsible for the Kupiansk, Liman, and Bakhmut axes. 
Along the Kupinsk front, Ukrainian forces repelled over 12 enemy attacks in the vicinity of Sinkivka and Ivanivka, Kharkiv Oblast. The Iskander M launched from Voronezh struck on this axis, in free Kharkiv. On October 29th, Ukrainian forces liberated three square kilometers west of Serhiivka, a settlement about 15 kilometers southwest of Svatova. The AFU made extensive use of snipers to cut off Russian reinforcements. Successfully, might I add. Geolocated footage last week from a distant airfield near Bilorechinsky, Luhansk, showed billowing smoke from a ground fire with secondary cook-off explosions. It confirms attackums were used in the area, which weren't defeated by the S-400 air defense system. The cluster munitions covered an estimated one kilometer of territory. On the Luman axis, the general staff reported one attack southeast of Terna, with Deep State reporting very intense fighting in Luman Perche and Rajhorotka. According to a source on the ground, Russia made marginal gains in the Serebransky woods, which are critical for accessing the city of Luman to the west. Furthermore, Russia has been successful in the forest because of Ukrainian command failures, and that the intensity of the fighting is higher than it was during the summer. The unspecified problems are being corrected. We note that these woods have been the scene of intense fighting since the successful counteroffensive in Kharkiv last year. When they've advanced here, Russia has done so through artillery fire and extensive use of trenches. In the Bakhmut operational area, Ukrainian forces repelled five attacks around Bohdanivka and Hromova and 25 attacks in Klishchivka and Andriivka, with Russia making significant gains in Klishchivka. Ukrainian forces are still continuing offensive operations south of Bakhmut and are now past the railway ground line of communication, GLOC, that's a supply line, south of Avdiivka. The Tavria Operational Strategic Group is responsible for the Avdiivka, Marinka, Shakhtarske, and Zaporizhia axes in the central eastern and southeastern part of Ukraine. Julian Ryopke, German publication Bild's military expert, I like to call him Russian propagandist instead, reported on October 30th that, wait, Bild is often cited by English language news outlets as a reliable source of information, but it's a German tabloid. It's kind of like if the National Enquirer in the U.S. did military analysis, throw it in the waste heap. In other words, do not listen to what Julian Robke has to report. Ukraine continues to inflict massive losses on Russia in defending Avdiivka, while Russia is making extremely slow small advances. The GSAFU reported repelling 60 attacks around Novokalinova, Opytne, Pervomaiske, Stepove, Avdiivka, Tonenke, Keramik, and Siverne. Ukrainian forces were forced to retreat from the quarry in Vodyana, just to the south and east of Avdiivka. Multiple sources show Russia is withdrawing forces away from other parts of the front to deploy around Avdiivka to attack from the north and south. In a phone call with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin this weekend, Ukrainian Minister of Defense Rustem Umerov confirmed 4,000 Russian soldiers were killed or wounded. Meanwhile, the UK Defense Intelligence release said Russia's losses in Avdiivka may be the worst in 2023. And that's saying something. But there's still full steam ahead. Tavria Group of Forces spokesperson Colonel Oleksandr Stupun said 40,000 troops are amassed in this area, including elements of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic Army, the Luhansk People's Republic Army, Storm Z, and combined arms armies from the central and southern military districts in Russia. This is a lot of personnel for a pile of mining waste. The beatings will continue until the morale improves. Speaking of improving morale, Ukraine shot down another Su-25 fighter jet near Avdiivka on October 29th using MANPADS, portable air defense systems. This is the 25th Su-25 fighter that Ukraine has destroyed. Congrats, guys! On the Marienka, Shakhtarske, and Zaporizhia fronts, the GSAFU reported defending against 80 Russian attacks southeast of Donetsk city in Marienka and Novomikhailivka. That's in Donetsk Oblast. Russia made marginal gains in Marienka and yet is taking high casualties. In Zaporizhia, Ukraine is likely making advances south and west of Verbova and west of Robotone into Kopani. The Odessa Operational Strategic Group is responsible for the Kherson Axis, Krim, and the Black Sea Fleet. On the Kherson Axis, Russian media exploded with rumors that Russian Colonel General Oleg Makarevich was fired as commander of the Russian Dnieper forces. 
He allegedly had intelligence not only of when Ukrainian marines were going to cross the Dnipro River in Kherson, but also where they were going to land and what size the force was. Deep State claimed that a, quote, bloody battle has been going on for three weeks to establish this bridgehead. According to Deep State, Makarevich knew and Ukraine lost the element of surprise, which cost Ukrainian lives. Ukrainian military intelligence, or GUR, must investigate the spy, leaking details of offensive operations to the Russians. Even knowing Ukraine's plans didn't stop the Marine from succeeding in establishing several small bridgeheads. Makarevich was accused by Russian mill bloggers of painting a rosy picture to his superiors. Um, hello? That's the whole point of this dictatorship thing Putin has going on, to paint a rosy picture, while the whole state is collapsing. Rumor has it that Makarevich will be replaced by Russian Airborne Forces, or VDV, Colonel General Mikhail Tiplinsky, who was demoted back in January and then reinstated. Tiplinsky was close to Wagner and unfortunately is one of the generals left that is somewhat respected by a rank-and-file troops. Born in Donetsk, Tiplinsky fought in the invasion of Transnistria and Moldova, both wars in Chechnya, Syria, and now in Ukraine. It's funny how these little breakaway regions just appear on Russia's border, isn't it? In the sector of Krym, or Crimea, and the Black Sea Fleet, Mikhail Razvazhaev, illegal occupation governor of occupied Sevastopol, posted an air raid alert message on social media. He also reported that motor vehicle traffic on the Kerch Bridge had been temporarily suspended. Smoke was reported in Sevastopol Bay, and pictures on Telegram show columns of smoke rising from the city on October 30th. The Russian Ministry of Defense later claimed that eight Storm Shadow, or Scalp EG missiles, were shot down by air defense, which probably means that eight long-range missiles hit their targets instead. Ukrainian Stratcom confirmed that it destroyed yet another anti-aircraft battery on October 30th near Olenivka, the one in the far western tip of occupied Krym not the one in Donetsk. Ukraine struck the Russian base with missiles around 3 a.m. local time, injuring 17 Russian military personnel, destroying five vehicles and likely destroying anti-aircraft equipment there. Remember that cyber attack last week? Well, I think the Russians are still on the phone with the help desk. Advisor to the occupation governor, Oleg Kryczkov's last post on Telegram, is still to not hang up the phone. It's been a few days. Ukraine's Minister of Digital Transformation, Mikhailo Fedorov, said on October 27th that Ukrainian hackers from the IT Army initiative took down the largest telecom provider in Russian-occupied territories. Krim Telecom, Miranda Media, and Mir Telecom were all attacked. That's definitely the opposite of being stuck on hold for the help desk. Moving on to the temporarily occupied territories. And we'll start with Mariupol. Mariupol is the largest city by pre-2022 population that's still under Russian occupation. Some estimates, using incomplete morgue data, without access to the city, show 80,000 to 120,000 Ukrainians have been killed during the siege. Before the full-scale invasion, the city was home to 450,000 people. This is the equivalent of the population of Miami, Florida. So, in layman's terms... It's the equivalent of half of population of Miami, Florida, having been killed. The Russian occupiers carry out genocide in many ways. They withhold food, medical care, and fuel. They deport children. They incentivize Russians to move with cheap apartments, promises of jobs, and other rewards. Russians conscript Ukrainians into the military. They allow drunk, drugged, incompetent, and violent criminals to murder civilians with impunity. And that's now, after everything the city has already been through. Headlines move on to the next thing so fast that it seems like a lot of people have already forgotten about the horrors of the siege of Mariupol. And it's important to keep that history alive. The documentary 20 Days in Mariupol does just that, and it's going to be available on streaming platforms in North America starting November 21st. Until then, we wanted to share with you the conversation we had with Mstislav Chernov, a journalist who, along with his team, stayed behind in the besieged city post-evacuation order to document exactly what went on there as Russian army approached.
My name is Mstislav Chernov. I'm Ukrainian film director and a journalist for Associated Press. I am an author of a documentary film, 20 Days in Mariupol. My 20 Days in Mariupol tells a story of a team of journalists who are struggling to keep working in besieged city of Mariupol in the first days of uh, Russia's full-scale invasion into Ukraine. And as they struggle to keep working, they tell stories of those people who suffer, lose their lives, or fight back for their land. So you and your team stayed throughout the 20 days, so the, basically the beginning of the siege. I think that the worst came after you fortunately were able to leave. You filmed this uh, sort of expecting it to touch the world in a certain way. Do you think your film accomplished its mission? And what was the mission behind staying and risking your life and documenting what has been happening? I don't think I ever, maybe somewhere deep down, but uh, I've been working in, in news in conflict zones for nine years already and I have very little illusions about how much journalism can change. However, at that moment the most important thing and the biggest responsibility for me and for my team was to actually get mm -hmm. these pictures out. They were so many important scary and and hard moments were hap were happening to to Mariupol to its citizens and we knew that there was no one else except us to tell about it to the world so we felt responsibility for doing that and all my mental capacity went into just trying to perform that that task to yeah. find the connection to save enough batteries to to film more and to 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 set it quickly and i'm not sure that even now, looking back, it has changed much. But I know for certain that, at least for some people who were stuck in Mariupol, it helped them directly. Their families found them through our footage and photos. And uh, Ukrainian authorities and various NGOs were able to negotiate at least start negotiations for the Green Corridor mm -hmm. that was opened later, through which thousands of people have escaped. So I hope the film helped. Well, back then it was not a film, it was just news reports. But I hope those images helped people just directly, not, mm -hmm. not impacting a grand global politics, but just those people on the ground. That would be really enough for me. As a Ukrainian person who's been who's been uh, following the war very closely and has you know been to Ukraine during the war and who has family living there, I obviously knew what was happening in Mariupol. I obviously was uh, very grateful to see the pictures that came out of there. But while watching the documentary, I think for me and for a lot of other people who were in the same position, those. Um, pictures that we've seen from the maternity ward, from other besieged areas of the city, they kind of came to life. I think to me, it was still just as harrowing to watch this and to witness it kind of happen in front of your eyes, especially because it's a movie theater, it's a big screen, you have the surround sound in front of you, you almost feel like you're there except you're in safety. So one of the things that I feel like this movie could help with a lot, if not changing people's minds, is evidence for The Hague. Um, right. First of all, making documentary films about events like Siege of Mariupol, mm -hmm. for example, for events that are both symbolic, mm -hmm. tragic, and, and you know, historically important mm -hmm. for Ukraine is absolutely necessary. Because in modern world where we are constantly bombarded with hundreds of tragedies that are happening all across the world, it is very easy to to forget what happened yesterday or a year ago, or two years ago. And more time passes, less those stories remain in our memory. So it was, again, it felt like a duty for me to, to make this film, to make sure that those tragedies of those people will not be forgotten. That's, that's one. And two, uh, when you watch news, we live in a world of misinformation and misinterpretation. And mm -hmm. when you watch news, one minute, two minute pieces, you easily can be subjected to misinterpretations mm -hmm. because all you see just cuts, 
quick cuts with voiceovers and so giving the audience more context which is possible only with a longer form like documentary films or podcasts for that matter uh, giving the audience more context helps helps people to form an adequate vision of of the events that unfolded yeah i think especially now two years two years into full-scale invasion nine years into uh russia's invasion in ukraine we have to do more of this in-depth bigger projects that that will give international audience the context of what is happening in ukraine you narrated the whole documentary as if you were reliving it again and as mm -hmm. if you were there. Mm -hmm. How was that sort of for you mentally to, to do? Because it must have, I understand that you've been through a fair share of really, pardon my French, crappy situations in your life when it comes to frontline reporting, right? But I don't think that anyone has really seen anything like Mariupol and what has been going on in Mariupol. And you were like in the midst of that. And then you had to do it again and relive it again to show the world what it was really like. He hit me the hardest when we started editing. And partially that happened because at that time I was in Kharkiv, in my hometown, mm -hmm. and it was heavily bombarded. And um, a house where I, um, where I lived as a student for five years was hit. It was, it was very, very personal, very painful. And it was very painful to see horrible deja vu that was happening. Kharkiv was not surrounded, but it was heavily bombarded and there were it was there was a possibility that it will be surrounded so i will live uh, through the same events that mariupol did so as i was filming during the day i was coming back in the evening and connecting over zoo with uh, with, with our editor michelle meissner she was in boston at that time so we kept editing through the night and at that moment it was i think it was the most devastating because i relieved Mariupol over and over every second of it. And I was living through what was happening to my hometown. So yeah, I almost mentally collapsed at that point. But, um, you know, I think, I think as journalists, we are generally very privileged comparing to, to those people who we film and whose stories we tell, not only because we make a choice of living through this traumatic event. And those people who we, whose stories we show, they didn't make this choice. Also, we have somewhere in the back of our heads, we have this understanding of the meaning of everything we're going through. We at least have a purpose to tell the world about what we see. But those people who suffer, those people who lose their families, their homes, they, don't know why this is happening to them. So this question, why, is, I think is the main question of the whole film. Why is this happening to us? And yeah. uh, it's asked in the film by a mother who lost her child. And for now, we'll leave you with that about Mariupol. The full interview with Mustislav Chernov is available on our sister podcast called The Press Lounge, linked in the description, where you can listen to the journalist share more details about the events on the ground and how him and his team during the editing process were picking what was ethical to include in terms of human suffering to portray the reality versus what would be too personal and how they approached that process. And now we'll move on to the home front. On the home front, Ihor Klimenko, Ukraine's Minister of Internal Affairs, suspended the Deputy Chief of National Police, Dmitro Tishlek, while he's under criminal investigation. Investigative news outlet Bihus.info published a story on October 27th revealing Tishlek's wife had a Russian passport, and then Tishlek was driving cars and staying in properties belonging to a leader of a Russian gang. Not suspicious at all. Natalia Humanyuk, the spokeswoman for Operational Command South, reported that Russians dropped 32 guided bombs on Kherson on the evening of October 28th alone. By our count, Russia has dropped more than 100 of these bombs on civilian areas along the front over this weekend, especially in Kherson, Avdiivka, Kupiansk, and Kharkiv. In Izum, a fire station hit by a Russian missile injured eight first responders and damaged the fire station and 13 pieces of equipment. 
This story, and really every story that includes firefighters in Ukraine, is very personal to us. Our research assistant, John Grumpy Stamp, is a former firefighter with the Newfoundland Fire Department, which he proudly served for 37 years. So we wish those guys a very speedy recovery. Rumors swirled on Ukrainian Twitter and Telegram on October 27th that Russian president slash dictator Putin was dead. It didn't turn out to be true. Don't fall for propaganda, even if you might want to. And I want to elaborate on that a little more. There seems to be this false idea in the Western world that once Putin dies, everything is magically going to come back to normal. It will not. Putin is not one man. Putin is a government system. Behind this Putin, there are many other Putins, and I don't mean his doppelgangers. I mean people with the same mindset. If it was up to just one man, and the entire system of the government didn't support this politics, it would simply not happen. It's incredibly naive to think that this one person could cause so much chaos in the world and continue to do so, unsupported and just feared, over a two-year time frame. Russia has a long history of imperialism, colonialism, and discrimination of its minorities and neighbors. Putin's death, although undoubtedly a pleasant event, would not change the course of world's geopolitics, and nor would it change the course of the war in Ukraine. Speaking of unsubstantiated rumors, let's talk about the Russian Federation and effectively occupied Belarus. On October 28th, an unknown source on local Dagestani Telegram started a rumor that the Russian government was settling Israeli refugees in the area. The source claimed the refugees were staying in Hasavyurt, Dagestan, and called for demonstrations to occur in the center of Mahachkala, also known as Anji in the local Kumik language, the capital of Dagestan. Hundreds of Dagestanis showed up at the airport, broke in, blocked the runway, and tried to break into an airplane returning from Tel Aviv. The rioters tracked the plane and flight radar before it landed and blocked anyone from leaving. Amid chants of death to Jews and searching for Israeli passports or Israeli visa stamps, the crowd sometimes got physical with local security, who were simply overwhelmed. Rosguardia had to be called in to control the situation. In a huge shock, no one with an Israeli passport was found. Let's analyze a little bit. But first, some background. This exact same playbook was used by now presumably dead warlord and troll factor Yevgeny Prigozhin in 2016 leading up to the U.S. presidential elections. A Senate investigation found Russian trolls in St. Petersburg created fake pro-Hillary Clinton and pro-Donald Trump rallies in Florida, targeted civilians on racial lines, and created in-person protests that a small number of people showed up to. Hmm. Second, and more importantly here, Russia has an extremely long history of persecuting Jewish people, and has used this religious hatred for its own purposes. It's classic scapegoating. When someone is too busy hating someone else, they don't focus on who the real enemy is. Russian ultranationalists, who always were close to power, if not in power, since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, have allowed state propaganda to cast President Zelensky, who is Jewish, as a Nazi and the puppet of the globalists in an effort to discredit him and justify the invasion of Ukraine. In doing so, the Kremlin has created an ethno-religious tinderbox in its malingering empire of some 144 million people. It's also important to note that Dagestan is a republic with mostly Muslim population. Therefore, it would be an easy target, given today's state of affairs, to incite hatred against Jews specifically there. Today, Putin blamed Ukraine for instigating the violence. There is no evidence right now to support this claim. It could as easily be someone within Russia who wants to destabilize the regime. Putin has authorized this hybrid warfare tactic since the advent of the internet deploying it against Estonia, European and Asian states, and then the UK and the United States. Russian officials may be trying to mask their own culpability in creating an anti-Semitic fervor to justify its invasion of Ukraine. If the anti-Semitism continues to spread, it poses a danger to the regime itself, which is already under pressure. On its face, it may appear stable, but Putin is still weak from the attempted coup last year. Not to mention the ICC arrest warrants, international sanctions, greater dependence on Iran, North Korea and China, and the shrinking economy. Interest rates inside Russia hit 15% as inflation climbed over to 7% on Friday. The ruble is still coming down from its $102 low earlier this month. So it might be the time when the regime is looking for… new old tactics. Moving on to the news worldwide. 
In news worldwide, governments might finally be waking up to the threat of the alliance of Russia, China, and Iran. States firmly in their orbit include Belarus, Cuba, Libya, Hungary, North Korea, Slovakia, Serbia, Syria, and Venezuela. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Israel denounced Russia for inviting Hamas to visit Moscow last week. The Hamas-Israel war is generating strong anti-Israel sentiment across the globe, and Russia is no exception. Look no further than the Gistan. The information space is awash in propaganda and misinformation or disinformation from the conflict, and world leaders aren't helping. Hungary's prime minister-slash-dictator and provincial peasant Viktor Orban gave an anti-Semitic speech at the Conservative Political Action Conference, better known as CPAC, in Texas just yesterday. The globalists can all go to hell. I have come to Texas. We must take back the institutions in Washington and in Brussels. We must find friends and allies in one another. Turkey as president-slash-dictator and wannabe kidnapper Recep Tayyip Erdogan gave a bellicose speech-threatening war with Israel, which attracted 500,000 people. All Israeli diplomats had to leave the NATO country. In Montenegro, Serbian national Andrija Mandic was elected president of parliament and is already raising eyebrows in Podgorica. Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic is a longtime ally of Putin. He opposed Montenegrin independence in 2006. Mandic has also promised to back out of the EU and to explore withdrawing from NATO. I mean, bon voyage, by all means. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is winning no allies. Exasperated U.S. advisors left the country, leaking their concerns to the New York Times. A new profile of U.S. national security advisor and attackums blocker Jake Sullivan was published, answering many of our questions. Apparently, he was behind Obama's reset with Russia, went over Hillary Clinton's head once to promote peacenik trade policies with China, and was caught sleeping on the attack on Israel. According to the profile, the Yale and Obama administration alum has risen so far, so fast, by telling superiors what they want to hear, just very eloquently. The war in Ukraine is driving further divisions in the U.S. Republican Party. New House Speaker Mike Johnson has introduced a standalone bill for $14.5 billion in aid for Israel, separating it from Ukraine aid. Republican candidate for president and former ambassador to the United Nations under Trump Nikki Haley gave a speech in Nevada this weekend that laid out the case for why those who abandon Ukraine will abandon Israel. Ukraine is a peaceful, pro-American country. The dictator of Russia is evil. He's a war criminal who's guilty of genocide. We should give Ukraine what it needs to kick Russia out of its country. To be clear, Israel and Ukraine have significant differences, but they have even more significant similarities. In both Israel and Ukraine, An evil regime is responsible for starting war. Iran and Russia are joined at the hip. And they're both unlimited partners of communist China. Iran, Russia, and China are all part of an unholy alliance. They have no problem invading their neighbors. They have no regard for human life. And they all share the same goal. They want to wipe out freedom and they hate America more than anyone. Their ultimate goal is to destroy us. Just listen to what the dictators say. They tell us their goals very plainly and transparently. This is not just about Israel security or Ukraine security. This is profoundly about America's security. It's shocking and appalling that so many of our leaders and would-be leaders don't get this. It's not just Joe Biden. There are plenty of Democrats and Republicans who fail to understand the nature of the threats we face. Mark my words. Those who would abandon Ukraine today are at risk of abandoning Israel tomorrow. Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader, where Ukraine defense package has strong bipartisan support, spoke at the University of Kentucky with Ukrainian Ambassador to the U.S. Oksana Markarova. Russian victory would embolden Putin's growing alliance with fellow authoritarian regimes in Iran and China. Think of it as an excess 
an axis of evil, China, Russia, and Iran. So this is not just a test for Ukraine. It's a test for the United States and for the free world. This is a moment for swift and decisive action to prevent further loss of life and to impose real consequences on the tyrants who have terrorized the people of Ukraine and of Israel. And right now, the Senate has a chance to produce supplemental assistance that will help us do exactly that. So let's remember what's at stake here. Russian victory in Ukraine would imperil the security and economy of all of Europe, our largest trading partner and strategic ally since World War II, and endanger the engine of our own economic growth here at home. If Russia prevails, there's no question that Putin's appetite for empire will actually extend into NATO, raising the threat to the U.S. transatlantic alliance and the risk of war for us. Markarova compared Putin to Hitler in her appearance. Emboldened dictators do not stop. I am 100% sure that if, God forbid, Ukraine falls, and we will not let it happen, but if that happens, it's just an invitation for Putin to go farther. And if he attacks a NATO country, it's Article 5. You will have to defend it with your troops on the ground. As I said, we can stop it while it's still in Ukraine. We, are, we live, unfortunately, so much in 1939 moment. And we just have to realize that this new Hitler has to be stopped while we can still stop him in Ukraine. Otherwise, this conflict will widen and all of us will have to fight. With a closely divided House, strong presidential backing, and strong Senate support, Speaker Johnson is playing a dangerous political and geopolitical game. Now some history and analysis. Kremlinologist Mark Gagliotti said two weeks ago that Russia and Iran were frenemies, cooperating where possible, but competing for influence in the Middle East. We strongly disagree with Professor Gagliotti. This may have been true before the full-scale invasion, but certainly isn't true anymore. They're all in. For some background, let's explore the history. Muskovy, which literally means swamp, was established as a small, far-flung outpost sometime in the early 12th century as part of Kyivan Rus. Kyivan Rus was a kingdom based in Kyiv, founded in 5th or 6th centuries, the oldest site of Slavic culture. Rus comes from the name of the Viking who conquered the city in the late 10th century. Muskova was sacked at least twice by the Mongols starting in 1237. The Muscovites collected taxes and worked with the Mongols and the Khan to outmaneuver their rivals in Tver. After 250 years of Mongol rule, which Muscovites today say was very oppressive, even though they were favored by the Mongols, Muscovites were more or less autonomous by 1480. They learned how to take a thorough census from the Mongols, for collecting taxes and for conscripting soldiers. Muscovites still employ conscription today. Much of their political institutions, law, language, military, and culture, comes from the Khanate. It was fashionable to speak Tatar and adopt Tatar surnames. Muscovy, as an empire, expanded east and south before moving west. They defeated the Kazan Khanate in 1557. St. Basil's Cathedral is a monument dedicated to the sacking of Kazan. Muscovites expanded their land holdings all the way to Alaska, California, Hawaii, committing atrocities against hundreds of people along the way. Eventually, Muscova turned west. Ukrainian-speaking Cossacks sought Muscova's help in 1667 to overthrow their Polish occupiers. Muscova eventually invaded from the east and split Ukraine along the Dnipro River. They didn't first conquer Kyrym, an Ottoman protectorate, until 1783, and Galicia, the western part of Ukraine, until 1914. Likewise, they didn't conquer Azerbaijan, Dagestan, Armenia, or Hayastan, Georgia, or Sakartvelo, from the Persians until the early 1800s. The Russian and Persian empires competed for centuries. Russia backed the authoritarian regime in Persia, Iran, in its 1906 revolution, Shout out to our listener Ronak, whose great-great-grandfather fought the Russians in the revolution. They formed an alliance in an effort to insulate their dictators, who have been in power for longer than we've been alive. Putin, age 72, has ruled for 24 years. 
Ayatollah Khamenei, imam of the flying mopeds, at age 84, has ruled for 35 years. China, another historical competitor, has been ruled by Xi Jinping, age 70, for 12 years. His Communist Party is convinced of its greatness and destiny for world dominance. In fact, Russia and Iran do too. Fun fact, sociological studies show only the Iranians have negative views of Russia for supporting their oppressive regime. All three powers, geriatric dictatorships deriving legitimacy from ultranationalism, face global isolation, sanctions, demographic problems, and instability. The fear of revolution, or a coup, and the fear of being cut off from 80% of the global wealth bonds them together. It's eerily reminiscent of fascist Italy, fascist Germany, and imperial Japan. Whether the U.S. can continue to be the arsenal of democracy, like it was in World War II, is up for debate. Historian Timothy Snyder, speaking on October 20th from Kyiv, said this about the armament of Ukraine. People forget two very important things. We, we forget that it's not us that are, who are doing the fighting in Ukraine. It's the Ukrainians who are doing all the fighting in Ukraine. The help that we're providing is, is financial, military, humanitarian. Um, we've just sent some attack missiles. We've got about 1,200 of those things that are obsolete or obsolescent that taxpayers are going to have to pay to disassemble. Or we could give them to Ukraine and they could use them to win the war. We forget that the Ukrainians are doing the fighting and all we have to do is supply. And the second thing we forget is that it was American economic power, not just the military, not just the decisiveness and the courage, but it was American economic power, which underlay the victory of the Second World War. With our economic power, with the economic power of the Europeans, we should be able to make sure that the Ukrainians win this war as well. History may not repeat itself, but it can rhyme. That's the brief for now. Remember to check your sources and don't fall for propaganda. Join us on YouTube and TikTok for more Ukraine content and live news reports. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our work on Substack. It's a very convenient way to keep up with the news. We'll be back on Wednesday with more updates. Until then, stay safe, everyone. Papa.